Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Two Have and Two Roll podcast. My name is Oliver. On this show, Robin and myself spoke with Noah. Noah is a LARPer and is a player in the Empire LARP system here in the UK. Noah's character is currently in the Nation of Urizen. We talk about the Nation of Urizen. We also talk about the healing game, the in-character hospital also that is at Amble. We talk a little bit about lineage. I also apologize for the quality of my voice in this show as I was recovering from a sickness that I've had the past couple of weeks. If you're watching this on YouTube, give us a thumbs up. If you're new here, consider subscribing, hit the bell so you know when a new episode is posted. If you're listening on your favorite audio platform, consider giving us a nice review. This will all help people find us. If you would like to support us, there are ways down in the description below. The best way to support us though is to hit that subscribe or that follow if you are listening on podcast. And with that all out of the way, we'll get into our conversation with Noah. <laughs> so we, have oh, no, we have Noah with us. No, Noah, why don't you tell us uh, how you got started in LARP? What's your LARP origin? So essentially, um, I will admit, I will admit, when I came to the UK, I was a massive weave. Uh-huh, yeah. I met a lot of very different people because I was weave as heck. Uh-huh. Um, I was 16 years old. I loved dressing up. I loved playing characters. And one of my closest friends actually went to empire for experiencing something different and i saw the facebook pictures and i was like wow this is really cool i want to talk more about it and with them and so we got talking and he, he was just like gushing about it being like you're in the middle of the field it was muddy as hell but it was so fun people dress up you can make your own characters and that's how i got introduced to larp and to empire and yeah, I went to my first empire. It was rainy as it can get. It was <laughs> reasonably cold, but I had so much fun. And when I came back home, I was like, yep, I am hooked. <laughs> Just like hooked from that is amazing. What what year was that then when you went to your first empire event? I think uh, it was like 2016, 2017. Okay, yeah. It's really young. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a two thousands baby, so <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. So um so when you when you first went then, um you said that so Empire was your, your like first ever LARP event. Did you was it what you because for us, LARP just wasn't what we thought it was going to be like. Was it what you were expecting it to be like? I came with the in mind with the fact that I had absolutely almost no idea what LARP was like um, because uh, coming from Spain the LARPing scene is a little bit more blossoming lately but especially in southern Spain the LARP scene is very secluded and very niche Okay. and therefore I was not exposed to LARP at all the only thing I was told is yeah you get to play your character and you just have to see it because Ambelish is so amazing and so full of life and it's nothing like he could have experienced or explained to me before and so I came with a very very open mind and when I experienced Ambil for the first time it was a mind-blowing experience honestly yeah have, have you ever looked back uh like have you ever looked at LARPs in Spain now that you've been doing LARP in the UK for a while have you actually looked at some of the LARPs in Spain and gone and found out what's over there I don't know if is there any big LARPs over there so actually at the moment in Spain um, because I'm not super into the LARP scene in Spain, but I'm trying to get into it these last year and a half or so. There is actually this really um, cool organizers called Ephemeral Events, and they were doing a Witcher LARP, both a national and international one. And it seemed to have gotten like really good reception. Mm-hmm. And I really, really want to go. So fingers crossed that this year I can actually go back to my home country and experience the LARP scene in there. Yeah, are you a Witcher fan? I delved into the game, started delving into the show, and I have a friend who I know from tabletop roleplay. I do have experience with tabletop roleplay, mm-hmm. and yeah. he's just gushing to me about Witcher and the world that it involves, and especially just the political tension. Yeah, is so interesting, yeah. and especially just 
the intrigue and the magic system and everything. Yeah, because I can't. Yeah, I want to dip my toes into it. So. Yeah, because I can't. <laughs> I, I know that because there's a Witcher lot that's popular here. Is it Five Kingdoms? I think. I think it's called. I think, yes, I think that's what it's called. Kingdoms. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and people speak quite highly of it. Now I can't. Like I've, I've. I, I cannot get into the witcher because i just i i, I own the game i think i own the game on like pc and playstation and every pretty much all these platforms. like everything i think you've got it on. I've, I've, <laughs> I've, I've i've not i've not managed to just get into it. not that i just like oh i, I play this and i hate it I, for, for whatever reason i can't get into the tv show uh, i've not read the books um and a lot of people are always surprised but that they're like ollie i thought you'd be really into the witcher because i you know i love game of thrones i love uh, lord of the ring i love all that, that type of fantasy i love to laugh as everyone knows uh but i'm almost like i'm always tempted to try a witcher larp without getting into the witcher just to come into it with like completely like not knowing what yeah. to expect and not having any idea on the law i think that would be quite a cool thing to go to <laughs> I think especially when you're trying to participate in new LARPs, whether that might be a Witcher LARP or an Empire LARP, the most important thing is to have a sense of like passion behind it yeah. and a yearning and a wish to get involved with it. Yeah. Because um, I do, especially with baby LARPers who have never LARPed before and yeah. are not super involved with the semantics of everything and the big lore stuff and everything, as long as you welcome these people in, they're own interest and desire to participate really carries them very far and that's why a lot of LARPers tend to have a very good first LARP experience because it's just the excitement of it all yeah yeah, yeah it's all new and um, exciting like you said and it's just it's something that you don't tend to experience anywhere else really um LARP is just yeah and like, like you said be a, a witcher LARP or an empire LARP or any type of LARP um like with with what what you guys are saying obviously about um about which are again i i've not played the games or read the books or anything i've watched a tv series but that is the extent of my knowledge but i know that there is a lot of other larping systems out there i'm not a huge sci-fi fan but there's a lot of sci-fi larps and i'm like Do you know what might like it might actually like the larp more than the actual genre itself <laughs> oh, i'll tell Absolutely. you what i, I saw a uh i saw there's, there's a stargate uh, group in the UK, so they, they do a lot. I'm like, I love Stargate SG One. I'm totally up for that. Thing is, with love is it just um, Empire you do, Noah, or, uh, or do you branch out to other ones? Because because LARP is it takes up a lot of your time just doing one game, you know? Yeah, I think Empire has been my longest term commitment out of all the LARPs I've done. Which, yeah, I mean, in hindsight, they're not a lot ish. Empire has been like. My first and main love, it's like ugh, Empire. I have done <laughs> Vampire the Masquerade, both uh -huh. Mother Nights, Dark Ages, and different settings of Vampire the Masquerade. Um, I do have a bit of a 50-50 feeling about Vampire the Masquerade because while I do enjoy the universe of World of Darkness very much, uh -huh. yeah. sometimes it can be a bit polarizing when it translates into actual parlor arts and the such. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have done College of Wizardry uh -huh. um, a couple of times, and I have found myself really enjoying that. It was actually my first introduction to, I think it's called um, Nordic LARP style. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, what's, what's the difference between a Nordic LARP style and a non-Nordic LARP style? I am not 100% knowledgeable with this, and I might get mixed a little bit mixed uh -huh. up. <laughs> but while in Empire, a majority of the game that you engage in is pvp but mainly the improvisation yeah you improvise your character you improvise yeah. the situation that you're in and you react in the moment mm -hmm. meanwhile in those systems you usually um either pre-arrange things or pre-discuss things um with other players oh, you yeah. play to lose sometimes mm -hmm. people really enjoy playing to lose mm -hmm. they're like yeah i know that we're both running for for example let's say both of our characters are clashing that they're both enemies and they want to aim for being the top of the class yeah yeah but yeah. i want you to explicitly know humiliate me i yeah. would love that it would make my game so cool and so amazing yeah so you'll take you're taking a little bit of the improv away from it so it's almost like a it's a, it's a pre-written script of a story that you're kind of acting out that's interesting yeah. then yeah we'll just wait till robin i think robin's just coming back <laughs> oh no robin come back <laughs> we miss you 
There you are. Hi, Robin. They, have, they, have, they, have, they, have they sorted it? It's sorted. Well, well done. Well done. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no was just Sorry. saying that the uh, like the Nordic LARP system is that you it's as not that it's scripted, but you discuss like who's going to like what the things that are going to happen, I guess. So in the the so, so, go on. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say so like the um so obviously in Empire we have our um we we have things like our, our military council and we have our different battles that take place in a Nordic like would you have something similar but already have the outcome of those battles um planned or semi-planned for example I have not done a Nordic style where it has been uh in a big battle setting oh, okay yeah. um the most that I've done is on one-on-one -on -one conflict some because a lot of the um core mechanics of that is especially making sure that you have the consent of the other person and mm -hmm. that you don't just ambush them for example in a vampire the masquerade LARP that I did I had this very very deep confrontation with this other person and so we're just, you know, having our dinner, chatting along. And I was like, you know what? I think it would be cool if I went up and stabbed you. Is that okay? <laughs> and he was like, oh, yeah, amazing. Go do that. And so yeah. we both, like, prearranged it and set some parameters. Like, look, like, I'm going to stab you. And he's like, okay, so what do you do? I'm just going to grab your arm, obviously. And I'm just going to throw you across the floor. And it made for, like, a really dramatic scene. Um, nobody nobody else is expecting it, but obviously because both of us were in the heat of that action and we mm. both knew exactly what was happening and it made it even more fun. That, that's that, no, that sounds amazing, actually. Like, I know that um, at Empire, on a small scale, those sort of things happen in certain areas. I think um, I might be mistaken here, but I think the Imperial Orc Fighting Pits, they do a similar thing there where they've um, pre-scripted certain things out because it's physical grappling and things like that but having a whole system like that does sound like a lot of fun actually just that whole you know I'd like to stab you would you be okay with that that's <laughs> definitely something that happens at Empire definitely uh, <laughs> but th those type of interactions I would uh, it's not it's not something that you have to do and like you say you can just go into Empire and it just improv your way through but I, I do like to uh, definitely blow that whistle that to make sure people know that that is going on because sometimes a lot of the misunderstandings that seem to come up with this type of LARP is that people will go and do a type of role play and they think it's okay when it's not because they've maybe seen other people do certain type of role play and they didn't realize that there was a a conversation beforehand like um when we we're talking to Dave about ball gowning and things yes. like that so or yeah or th things like oh yeah I know I want to go up and yeah like stab this person or have a dramatic fight it's like you you can totally do that between players and just be like hey you know I want to you know wouldn't it be cool if we had a fight in the glory square and you like kick my ass what do you think about that and then you could like plan it out and be like yeah it's essentially the play to a lot of people love to play to lose yeah because sometimes it's the core aspect of this whole roleplay mechanic is to create a story and sometimes in your character's story they they'll probably not win all the time bad things will happen to them or they might encounter obstacles and it's up to you and the other players around you to create that safe environment to explore that story and put it into different heights not to say that everything absolutely everything must be prearranged but yeah it's nice to have certain key things because then if you're not comfortable role playing that and you're like, yeah, the vibes are a little bit off with that. I'm not interested in role playing that anymore. And it's clear and it saves everyone so much more grief yeah. and it sets realistic expectations with each other when it comes to role play because role play is about consent and communication mainly, in my yeah. opinion. I, exactly. It's it so much more enjoyable for everyone. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with you there. Like, there is a lot of consent. There's a lot of consent within LARP. Um, like, like we've, we've given examples there, obviously, that there are certain things that happen in the game. There's there's fights, there's intimidating, you know, arguments, there's romance. But all of these things, there is that consent around there from everyone first. And it's interesting, you know, when you're saying that um, a lot of people, you know, they that you do you like to lose sometimes and I guess when we're writing if we're playing games such as like tabletop RPGs and we're writing backstories for characters 
we all put something negative in there that's happened to us. We, yeah. all, we all want that, that that sort of like way of developing our characters. That's exactly what it is, is character development, which which is which is one of my it's it's my only sort of uh negative with Empire sometimes is that sometimes the threat level in combat is maybe a little too high. Like sometimes I'm like it's like a lot of people love having their characters die and they love the death experience but it's it's usually when they have like planned it out and even when it's not planned the stuff they do after the fact is like oh yeah i'm consenting to now to death and you know i get to role play out but sometimes like it, it, the frustration in people being like i did not want to just die on that silly skirmish just because some some commander made a bad a, a captain made a bad call you know and now yeah. this character <laughs> that i've like spent a fortune in kit on and i had all these plans for is now dead you know i i, I do feel like sometimes it's i don't i don't know how they would tone it down but sometimes people go because remember we are the heroes of the empire. We're not just like the rank and file soldiers. We are the we are the heroes of the empire. The so best. <laughs> exactly. So sometimes I'm even when I'm monstering, I'm just like they're like, okay, you're a monster. Yeah, okay, you are three hit points. You have cleave. So on my first event, or on all of our first events, I assume, like my monster was way more powerful than my hero was. You know, <laughs> and I'm just like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> like guess... in my third event. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. You go ahead. In my third of them, my character almost died in Battlefield, and oh god, I was it was a very bad call. I was left behind, and like I was, <laughs> I was really, really uh, because I was also like quite young, and I had grown quite attached to my character. Yeah, I was just like laying flat on the floor, just crying, like please, someone help me, please, like the, I, the tears were a little bit real <laughs> because I didn't want to lose my boy. <laughs> and it actually made for a very unexpected and very fun interaction that completely, that I was like, holy smokes, this is actually really cool that it happened. So you guys are acquainted with the Summer Heralds. Um, or so, you are, aren't you, I think? Are you? I am me? not a Summer oh, Herald. Oh, Oliver, sorry. No. Is Godric? No. Me a summer herald? No. Sorry, I thought you said are you that um, as in because I I'm sort of linked to winter. Are you? Are you I, I'm getting confused. Yes, I'm getting confused. <laughs> Explain everything to me. <laughs> <laughs> so in a in one of the main battles, right? Um, sometimes the some heralds might come along, and this time around, they were the summer heralds of Idanaris. Okay. And their whole thing is obviously like summer magic red face paint and stuff like that and i happen to be a red naga and okay. so one of the npcs oh okay that me calling out for help and in character all this was in character what he did mm. is that he gave me a potion he helped me stand up he helped me fetch my arrows and everything uh -huh. and all of the other npcs around were frozen because they were like what is he doing? <laughs> because my character is very visibly a Naga. Yeah. And the thing is, this man, right, this Summer Herald, suddenly did a double take. And he was like, wait, you are a Summer Herald, aren't you? And I just ran for the game. I just went for it. Yeah, just went for it. <laughs> and one of, the, uh, one of the refs was very amused about it. He just gave me a traumatic wood card. He was like, just go. Yeah. <laughs> just go. <laughs> just, if you just get away leave. with it. There are so many <laughs> stories like that. Yeah, Robin, like her oh. her the heralds are like the the things that the because the Eternals can't come through like to our realm, so they will yeah. send heralds. So that endless stalker that you fought, that was a that was a winter herald. That was a ah okay 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 yeah, I've got it, it now yeah. right yes <laughs> it's making sense now. <laughs> it's all making, it's, it's all different making heralds, sense. <laughs> different heralds for different Eternals. You just can't help putting their grubber little hand. On the empire's business. <laughs> uh, no, right. I've not fought. I've not actually fought alongside any. Have we had recently? Have we had any fight with us on the battlefield? Oh, I'm remember. not sure because yeah. after that experience, I was like, you know what? Battles, they're not for me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm done. Yeah. Did, was that your? Did you not do any combat then after that? 
No, it was also my very first experience with like proper combat and like proper battles and stuff. Yeah. And I was like, well, I almost died. I think I'm not going to repeat that because I'm way too attached to my character to lose yeah. them over a fight. Because especially with the way that battles work in Empire, mm -hmm. they can just be either go really good yeah. or really unpredictable. Yeah. I, I will say on the flip side of what I said earlier about sometimes they're a little bit too high frat. In Empire, if you don't go through the Sentinel Gate, you are pretty much immortal. Though, like, there's there's not really there's not really much that's going to get you if you don't go if you if you decide I'm a non com character and you're like and you you make a a conscious decision. Oh no, I want to survive. Then you, you're not going to get hurt, really. You know, it depends on the way that you play your game as well. Yeah, because I do know some people who have gone through three four characters already all of them non-com and it's because they just got involved with the craziest stuff oh yeah like yeah you, you, may, you make sure that you don't get like inquisited and then beheaded or something that's yeah <laughs> avoid the reaper don't be unvirtuous <laughs> it's, it's mainly because if you end up messing with the wrong things and the wrong people oh, it can go so wrong oh, yeah. but that's sometimes what a lot of people are looking for to make characters who leave an impact yeah and yeah. then just go and then they move on to the next one yeah yeah that's yeah. kind of what i mean by like making a conscious decision oh i'm not going to i'm, I'm going to avoid death and it's yeah you're, you're pretty much you're pretty much guaranteed to keep keep a hold of your character have you been playing the same character then for since you started Noah? yeah well, yes i have wow um <laughs> i feel like I know. Because when you said Naga, I, like, I was like, um, really? Has... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I feel like, especially since I started when I was a teen, that um the character has also like grown up with me, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And I, f I feel that now that I have more of, more or less the, I guess the maturity in the way to be like, okay, what do I really want to do with this character? And what do I really want to do with my game? Because the way that you play LARP, it comes with experience. It comes with the amount of time that you actually engage yourself in LARP. And, you know, some people are comfortable staying as the same character forever and ever because LARP is their comfort place and they don't want sudden change. And they find comforting to play the same character every single time. And as long as they go back happy back home, that's the most important thing. Some people just go through characters like it's nothing. Yeah. And some, and there's people in the middle point who are like, okay, I want this character to get to this point or to have something happen to them significant enough so that I can make peace with the fact that I could perhaps move on to the next one. With my character, Leo, mm -hmm. um, I did get involved with to certain different aspects of the game and especially because when I first started as well while I made some connections with people I didn't find exactly like my footing 100% and I felt yeah. sometimes a little bit lost in my role play mm -hmm. but eventually when I decided to engage in some role play which was to change nations that was the beginning of everything else i felt like my character was more fully realized and that i can now focus on the fact of like okay i want to do this and this and this and this and then this boy is done yeah i mean so that's what i wanted to ask you about actually because when when i met when when rnl met leo in character and we talked uh, leo told her about the story of changing nations and um she learned all of that in character and it was absolutely incredible everything you you, you told you, you told Arnel at the time so which uh, well I know which nation you started in but which nation did you start in and could you tell us a bit about that process of changing nations and what you had to do in particularly I think it was especially it's a, especially when it comes to changing nations and the such it's very individual to each person it can be a mix between in character things and out of character things to me it was a mix of both so mm -hmm. I first started in Wintermark. I found the nation somewhat appealing, but I mainly joined because I was like, oh, all my friends are here, so I want to yeah. be with my friends, and I'm going to make the best out of the 
story of Wintermark, the archetypes. I was a Steinier. I was a, a physic, a healer, a healer. And I wanted to really see that part of the game and explore that with my friends. But eventually, both the way that I role play my character and the w because I try to stick as best as I could to the hearth magic yeah. and the traditions and the nation, which is the most important thing you can do as your character to take those concepts and flesh out a actual human being out of them. <laughs> yeah. And so in character, um, Leo was feeling really lonely and really disconnected from Wintermark because it was getting really hard to connect with people in a sense. I had very specific friends, but nothing I could really exactly get myself 100% involved in because Wintermark is such a large nation. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in the out-of-character aspect, um, some of my friends decided to stop going to Empire or their priorities shifted or their interests moved. And so it left me in a state of feeling really lost, both in my character and in myself within the game. And so I had a very, very, very close friend of mine who was part of Eurozim. And our characters mm -hmm. had a very cute dynamic because my character had a immense crush on their character and not only that um they had several friends in Eurozen. so Eurozen, oh i personally found found Eurozen incredibly intimidating because mm. it's a nation filled with very like you're like oh yeah these people are like intelligent as hell they know exactly what they want to do they have all of their ambitions laid out and everyone looks like they're so well put together and it was so intimidating um, in character, and then that blossomed into an out of character friendships as well. I um, encountered people from Eurozone because I, as a physic, I decided to be around the hospital, and there's a yes. lot of Eurozone people in the hospital. And essentially, Leo had a bit of a heart to heart with these characters, and he was like, I feel so alone. I, I guess I'm just dumb old, silly old Leo, and I guess I'll just stay and do my thing. And they were like, Cleo, you're not stupid. You're <laughs> you're not dumb. And in a way, I felt myself, my own like self-doubt as well come through with that as well, because I found I I don't take myself too seriously. I think I'm a bit of a silly person. And so when I felt like that companionship and that encouragement, both out of character and in character, I was like, huh. Maybe I should be somewhere else. And then they suggested, you know, I think you would make a really good Urizani Leo because you have that determination and that yeah. ambition and that you would see your goals better realized in Urizen. So I was like, you know what? Yeah, let's give this a shot. I'm going to do it. And the, big, the biggest thing that you can get involved in when you do nation changes is with the Eggergolds. Because yeah. when you do a nation change, you have to break the previous Egregore bond and do a new one. Therefore, you must keep in touch with the Egregores of both your nations. The way that mine worked was that I approached the Eurozone Egregores and I told them, look, I am considering the fact that Wintermark is not for me and I have found kinship and companionship in Eurozone. And certain ideals of the Eurasian nation, I think I would be able to embody them and pursue them. And they were like, that's so nice. But we're going to test you, though. <laughs> 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 and I, I, at first I was like, oh, okay, fine, I'm going to do this. But I get it, because when you are changing nations in character, in the universe, in the empire it's such an important decision because it's your character forsaking and putting away their previous traditions yeah and the place they were raised in to assimilate themselves into a completely different nation yeah. so the way that they told me was like we want you to fully understand what it's like to be in your Zani. and once you prove to us that you are aware of this then we will test you. And if we feel like it's the correct decision, 
then we'll welcome you into your resent. And that got me thinking, character. I was like, okay, what do I do? How does a silly winter market like me fit into the echelons of elegant, intelligent, anti society? <laughs> I know. I'm going to do research. And I took a blank notebook. I took my pen. And every single day, I was in the Uruzani camp, sitting down with people, asking them, what's Arete? What's Poise? What's your Spire? Why do you feel like you're the best Uruzani ever? And things like that. And it actually, Uruzani is not a very big nation. Mm -hmm. And it made people be like, oh, there goes Leo with all his questions. Yeah. <laughs> Sit a little naga. Yeah. I, I bet because it's it because is it the smallest nation or is it second smallest? I'm not sure actually. I, because... I think it might be smallest. I think it's, it's sm or... well. Last I checked, it's either the, it was the smallest. Or... Yeah, but I think they can. It's a mix between high guard orcs and Urizen. Yeah, I think I think I think it's definitely between orcs and. Uh... Orison, I think it, it kind of changes about a bit, but yeah, when we were speaking to, we spoke to Kelly on the show about the orcs and speaking to other orc players, that they said that the benefit of being a small nation is that, yeah, it is a tighter knit community, you know. So, like you said, you you feel like you have yeah. a, a a high up because you can't. I mean, in these bigger nations, you can get. I imagine, especially like Wintermark and Navarre, I can imagine it's quite easy to get kind of lost in amongst all that. Yeah. <laughs> all of that. A hundred percent. And doing that highlighted my game so much because people loved talking about, because when you ask people about their characters and about their motivations, they love that, right? Yeah. You give them a, you yeah. uplift their game by giving them a chance to express themselves. And it helped. I didn't have to just be like, okay, I'm just going to wait until Empire's over, sit down, read the whole wiki, yeah. and then get quizzed. No, yeah. it, I made it part of my game. Yeah. I had my character go through the process of going to this nation and showing the determination to want to learn, which yeah. wanting to learn and wanting an education in a nation like yours is incredibly important. And by the time that he... that he had filled the, the, the a majority of that notebook with like the spires the sword scholars the different meanings and the constellations and the art and the archetypes and everything everyone was like okay go leo show the manners of your fantastic notebook everyone was just so pumped for me and it was <sighs> It's, it's almost a way as well because you're you're having those interactions which means you're you're creating those in-character bonds with everyone so that not only what started with with you proving to the the egregore something made instead made it that the entire nation wanted you there and wanted you to be part of it because you had made the effort to learn all about them and their story it's just yeah. it sounds so wonderful and I, again I mean, that must have been such a huge jump though, to go from a nation like Wintermark yeah. to Urizen because of just the sheer volume of people. I couldn't imagine doing that sort of that jump. But I mean... Also, they've got very different feels, right? Like yes. Wintermark is very like beardy, not Vikings and uh, creepy witches to Urizen. Not Vikings and creepy witches. <laughs> a load of not no. Vikings. Don't do the Calabasi dirty look like that. <laughs> yeah. All of our does not speak for both of us. Please don't come after us. <laughs> yeah, but they do have a very well. I mean, you, you you're probably your best one to educate me because I haven't actually set foot in the Urizen camp, uh, Urizeni camp at all. Uh, but the 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 vibe I get from them, like if I if I would want to, to play my kind of my D D wizard character who's all about seeking knowledge and that's all he does and he likes magic, would is that is that the type of fit Urizen? Is that the mold that would fit Urizen? Because that's the impression I get I get from them. It's the way that people see them superficially in that way, because that's the way that because there's the thing when it comes to the concept of poise. And mm -hmm. poise is to explain it, the way that you direct yourself and the impact that you make on other people mm -hmm. 
which is why it's very disgraceful in Arisa to lose the poise, because if you lose your poise, which means to lose your composure, and not to exactly lose your composure, but do actions that you have not thought about first before doing them, it makes an unprecedented impact, and that's very shameful. Which is why, like, Yurizani looked, like, so well put together and everything. Yeah. But then I met, like, some Yurizani's that I'm like, wow, you're just a gremlin. <laughs> 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 yeah, there's there's ways of getting around example, those briefs, right? <laughs> because, like, you don't have to be, like, cold calculating, yeah, I'm the man of crystals, the magic, the, the conclave. Mm-hmm. You don't need to 100% do that because there, there's Yurizani, like, the sentinels who are passionate and fears about protecting their nation mm-hmm. there's the sword scholars who have their, their spicy takes <laughs> not gonna okay lie. okay so the swords are, are these are these like archetypes then in the yeah. in the brief okay so you so the sword scholars are what, what are they are they are they the um kind of knowledge seeking uh, so the sword scholars swords. um they are um uh, before um the dreaded uh long long dark long, slash COVID. Long, long. <laughs> um they were starting to be a very very new archetype uh-huh. and so they were so they're essentially like warrior priests okay and they have a passionate dedication to like wisdom and reason mm-hmm. and they want to bring out the best virtue out of everyone um so what happened was that the sword scholars had, uh, the, as a way to condense it, the sword scholars had a big disagreement not only with the highborn, but also with Yurizanis who decided to embrace the way and everything. Mm-hmm. And so they were forced to essentially just hide their existence. Oh, okay. And Ooh. they've just re- very recently come back and essentially they're, they are, they can be quite confrontational. Uh, and essentially they are very intense yeah. um if there's some if i remember well there were some um, wins and everything that involved sorts colors not really liking the imperial synod well uh, <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> <laughs> because they descent from essentially the teachings of sulme okay and everything is about wisdom, virtue, martial, um, philosophy. So, so what? Where does that teaching come from? Then is that is that pre empire history or? I think if I remember well, it was it especially happened after the highborn revelation. I think it was okay. Okay, and, and because Suleiman essentially decided to go on her way, and she. <laughs> The way that I was like explained to it by a sword scholar in the field as well is that so they want to do her own thing. She didn't want to be involved with anyone, but they very stubbornly followed behind her and wanted to know more about her teachings and everything, which is why they're so confrontational and fierce and intense. Yeah, yeah. So, it sounds like um, they, they give off a bit of a, like a samurai kind of like from that what you're describing. I'm just like thinking like you know modern like you Ish. know like last yeah. the last samurai yeah. type feel you know <laughs> samurai in a modern <laughs> world type thing yeah it's definitely it's it's definitely like that i will say though as <laughs> the players who try to do the sword scholars they try to be as serious and gruff and intense as they can which is what i make in my personal objective to just come up to them and make them laugh <laughs> i want to pull a tiny little giggle at least each time each event because um as much as I am a poised, distinguished Rizani with my own goals and ambitions and my own pursuit of knowledge, uh, part of the impact of the poise that I want to do is essentially make people have fun and be comfortable. And if Leo doesn't see you giggle at least once, he's going to make it his mission to be like, like Yo, yeah. you must have positivity on your day. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, just the, the poise thing, is that where the rumor about or is any not like shaking hands or touching comes from is that yeah. is that is that where it's come from the personal space okay so essentially when it comes to personal space right um 
people have the presumption that it's like, oh no, like the years that they don't like you touching them because they're a bunch of prudes or something like that. Yeah, that's what that's, that's but... what I hear. <laughs> but it's actually more like not that they are. It's the with the way that Urizen works in regards to space. It's not that they are touch at birth. It's that they have a deep insistence on personal boundaries. Because it's a mix between etiquette and, if I remember well, the magic of those boundaries. Okay. Um, when it comes to the magic part of it, I do recall that this was a little bit more recently implemented, so I'm not 100% familiar with it, because also okay. my character is not a character who is magically inclined. Uh -huh. um, but essentially, personal space is very, very, very profound and very individual to each Urizeni. Mm -hmm. So entering a Urizeni's personal space is very, very significant and very important. And personal space can vary between each Urizeni. For example, like a Urizeni might be okay with you standing next to them. And other Urizeni, their personal boundaries is they're not okay with you being in their room. Okay, right, yeah. So so they can be, they can differ quite a bit then between different people. Yeah. And it also is part, because a lot of the way that it's also implemented in the game by some role players <laughs> is the relationship that you have with that person and especially the moment that calls for that action because the physical touch in a way is so important that in a way doing it too many times might make it insignificant. For example, a new Rizani doctor will know will have no qualms physically touching a patient because it's what's needed for their skill. But if they're greeting a family member, they might not touch them. Meanwhile, if someone is experiencing deep, deep grief and they want to comfort them, then it is up to them how they do it. And Sometimes some Urizani might be like, embrace that person or place a hand on their back. It's very individual to each person, which is why mm -hmm. it's very important um, in different aspects to know where that specific Urizani is coming from and your relationship with them. Yeah. It's, it's a hell yeah. of a lot deeper than just that. Oh yeah, yeah. they don't like, they don't want to shake yeah. hands. <laughs> that's the thing. That's what people they say. They're just like, oh, they just don't want to shake hands. But no, that's there. That goes. You know, there's a lot of um it's not behind it. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. For um, example, for myself, um, when my character does business with people, he will only shake hands with the people that he's doing business with. Once. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone gets like, one. As soon as that business is done, okay, shake hand. Yeah. Meanwhile, um, because he has this very profound love for his partners, for example, that he doesn't mind um being close to them, like physically close or like holding their hand or giving them a hug. It's very individual. Yeah. For example, like my character Leo is would be considered quite affectionate for a newer Zenny. Yeah. So yeah. he's not the he's not the standard. Yeah, not the but, standard for sure. But well, I, Leo is the yeah. only Irizani that RNL has ever met. Um, <laughs> literally the first and only Irizani RNL has met. <laughs> and I, I don't know if I ever actually told you what led to us meeting that day, but basically. Godric and Arnell were competing against one another for love stories and I was following yeah. Godric and he was like oh why don't you go to to, to Urizen then and I was like where's Urizen he was like oh, off that way quite in a random direction like I had no idea where I was going I was just wandering around going is this Urizen no and you were the first Urizeni that I because I think you were speaking to someone from the league at the time and I bumped into you and then we had that lovely interaction, that lovely story. And then 
what must have been about 15 minutes later, the pair of us walked past poor Godric still wandering around well, looking. Yeah, for I was story. trying to look for someone in the brass coat. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, Robin was like beating me for love stories. And I was like, then, then uh, well, Arunel was, sorry, Arunel was beating me for love stories. And then Arunel was like following Godric around. I'm like, I need to get more love stories. And I'm like, I need to go to the Brass Coast. And I'm like, why don't you like, oh, I need to go somewhere. I'll try somewhere else then. Or is it? I was like, yeah, it's that way. I just pointed it in a random direction. And she I was... didn't look really lost. I was like, oh no, is she okay? <laughs> <laughs> that's but that's a trick though. That's the trick that 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 Robin does or Aaron L does. Lost, okay. <laughs> And again, like I kind of like I always sort of like pick the people that look like they're the most approachable. So I kind of saw you through there, and I was like, oh, okay, right, let's go out, let's go speak to these people. And then, yeah, I mean, yeah. no, that was. I saw you, and I was like, I saw you, and I was like, come, come, let's just go have a sit down. It was like, lovely. Where is something to drink and something to eat? Let's just talk. Oh no, that was um. That was such a lovely interaction. And um, one thing that I noticed about, obviously about Leo is Leo was extremely, um, extremely friendly, but extremely like hospit- um, hospitable. That's that's the word, right? That's the word. <laughs> hospitable. If that was what you were going for, then yeah. <laughs> sure. And we had like such a lovely time and then a lovely wander back to Dawn. And since that interaction, it's like, that's the first time I'd ever met you. And then since then, I think I've seen you quite a few times. And honestly, it's your, your Naga makeup is just, it's incredible. It really stands out. It is absolutely beautiful. And I do have questions Thank about you. it. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Your, your Naga makeup, first of all, how how long does it take you to to get it all on and what how do you actually do your scales because I know there's many tricks out there for doing them but I want to know how you do yours because they look really good so when I first started I god I remember when I first started and just a scrammed little tent with other five of my six friends and just like putting everything on with like a stencil right and just be like, okay, uh, oh wait, is that the boot outside? Oh no, oh, oh, <laughs> it took me so long. <laughs> it took me like the longest time and then to get all my kid on and I'd just be like stumbling out of the tent like, I'm here, I'm here, I'm not missing the boot, I swear. But then I, as a cosplayer, especially when you put on wigs, you have wig nets. Yeah. And I was like, hmm, if I put them around my face... They look like scales. And not only that, the benefit with wig nets is that it, you look a little, you look very silly when you're putting them on, okay? Like, nah, <laughs> some, nah. sometimes you have to, like, what I do sometimes as well is you can also, like, scrunch them up, do a little knot at the top over here, and then it gives the scales the dimension of, like, because the fishnet, like, the, not the fishnet, the um, wig net will be larger gaps in here and smaller gaps as it goes to the center of your face oh that's a, that's a that's good, a good idea. Idea. So yeah. it gives it that dimension i'm too lazy to do the knot i just like okay i have this left over and just stuff it in my mouth and just <laughs> 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 and, you know how time it is at like 10 i think 9 10 yeah 10, yeah on, 10. on saturday sunday yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so usually it would take me like an hour and something to get ready nowadays however when you're so used because you're like okay first i put this layer then this other layer then this layer when you are used to know the steps that you take imagine like we start at night okay i wake up at 8 40 just drag my ass out of bed and my and my tent mate is like we have like 15 minutes i'm like oh, it's plenty of time. And I just, like, drive myself out of there. Just <laughs> pop on my contact lenses, which is very important. Try to put on your... If you're wearing contact lenses, keep your hands as clean as possible. And pop them on before makeup. Okay. I don't do it always. <laughs> I don't do it always. But that's the safest way to do it. Just if you have, like, makeup wipes, because when you are camping, hygiene is a little bit of a struggle to do yeah. just makeup wipe clean your hands with that makeup wipe and 
soak these the lenses with a little bit of contact lens solution even though okay. they're already soaking so they clear up a little bit they just like pop pop yeah that's what makes your <laughs> naga look really pop is the contact lenses uh, for, some people get on with them unfortunately i don't get on with them and <laughs> you cannot put them in <laughs> I, I really struggle like just just the way my eyelids are and like my upper lids and things like that, i really struggle and i don't really have very round eyes robin has like massive anime eyes so she just goes bam, bam, and they're in you know i i just really struggle to get them in so it was yeah we were um cosplaying as um jamie and cersei lannister and we're like well you know in the books they've got green eyes so we'll you know they're meant to be twins so we're gonna have to both have green eyes and i've got them in i'm already and it's like an hour later and he comes out of the bathroom looking like he's been crying and he's like i can't do it we're not wearing them yeah because i'm not ice squeamish or in i just couldn't get them in i was just like oh, I in my eyes just... yeah for me i had a very big struggle when i first started wearing contact lenses because i i am autistic mm -hmm. and unfortunately when it comes to certain sensory stuff it's like oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> i do it <laughs> Now it's just like, let's go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you get used to it, because that's the thing that for, for the not because I've if there's another lineage I would want to do, it'd be Naga just for the look because I just I just enjoy I just enjoy reptiles and that, that look, and also <laughs> it just it's such a different look from a changeling that I'm playing already. So I feel like oh yeah, that would make it should make it so it's I look like a completely different character. But I would want to have the contact lens look, and that's the one thing put me off. <laughs> I was just like. Ugh. I will say as well, um, especially when you are doing a lineage, just it says in the wiki, it says it everywhere. I will say it myself as well. When you go ham with your lineage, it's very hard to scale it back. It's better to use the other things up, up to your comfort because you're camping for three, four straight days. Yeah, you yeah. have to put everything on every single day. Your pores are clogged, your eyes are dry, you're tired as hell. And I remember when I first started doing my eyes, I did them the typical like TTDI lenses, like snake lenses. Mm -hmm. And then I decided to be extra. And I, the thing with the snake eye lenses from TTDI or on the other like Halloween brands and stuff, or just normal brands in general, is that they'll spin. Contact mm -hmm. lenses naturally spin around your eye um, because of the fact that you know, your eyes wet, it's a plastic in your eye, it will do a little spin. Yeah. But obviously, <laughs> when you have the snake eye pupil, that's why sometimes you'll see some of the Nagas on field look a little bit wobbly eyed. <laughs> no <laughs> fault of them. <laughs> Hit too hard no, in battle. No fault, if, uh, with no fault of their own, but it happens and you can't help it. And so I decided to go for these very expensive weighted lenses. Oh. So what they do is that they put a little weight so that the um, snake eyes stay as straight as possible Whoa. all day. Wow, okay. The thing is, though, the thing is, though, because they are, like, almost theater grade, Yeah. they are very thick. And yeah. you can very easily feel them in your eyes. And I wore them for like two years straight. Oof. It brought the look so well. Yeah. But when I when I came back to Empire after pandemic and everything, I was having very, very bad meltdowns over my contact lenses because these felt so heavy on my eyes. Yeah. And I spent years not going to continuously to Empire. So it just it made me dread having to put on my makeup all the time. Yeah. Which is why I decided to have contact lenses that didn't have the snake eyes, but the, but had a similar eye color to the one that I established for Leo. So nobody could tell the difference. And the thing is, nobody will point that out. And if no. they do point that out, just dismiss them. Because it's the same way of the fact that as long as you're trying to keep up a proper kit, but also not try to go over your comfort and trying to prioritize your comfort is so important. Yeah. Especially when you're out in the field, there's no yeah. shame in doing that whatsoever. No. no, I mean, that's, that's why I didn't go for, um, I didn't go for antlers for my channel. I literally just went for the ears and that was it. And even that 
is enough for me sometimes. Even that is like it's like two two minutes before like time, and I'm like, oh, can I get it on? Why can't I get it? <laughs> Uh, it's usually cool? yeah it's usually like um robin can you stick them on for me i'm oh. like sure well it's usually because i'm like trying to like dodge in and get use of the mirror you know before like <laughs> while you're you're doing it so i i have seen a few like people i think that have, have put on like very long large antlers and maybe like for a start i'd be regretting it because that's what your thought process was robin right because you had the shorter antlers and you were like mine have grown want... just, yeah. just just they've grown just under an inch over the winter which i think is natural enough for the changeling antlers just slightly because <laughs> if you head out with like massive ones then like you say every single time then you're gonna be like oh and i have to put these on and i hate fighting with them and i hate trying to get into the tents with them and like you said you end up like you don't want to end up resenting putting yeah, on your trappings, you know? You yeah. don't really want to be doing that. A hundred percent. I feel like, especially with, with what I'd done with makeup, the most fun thing for me was, oh, it was very challenging, but it was so fun. Yeah. And it was, there was a small um, point in which my character, because of Leaving Nations, got attacked. And so I had everyone was obviously not like everyone of my character's friends and stuff they were not having a good time they were like oh poor baby <laughs> because, <laughs> especially because of the fact that i'm very young and i start very young everyone is like ah leo the baby <laughs> <laughs> so i did like um sfx makeup with like burns and like cuts and everything and i had my blind contact lenses on and it was a really solid look it was yeah. so fun i loved every second of that weekend but and this is why it's very good to try to research the things that you're putting on before you take them over to the field i had my blind lenses on which already impair your sight a little bit by making mm -hmm. it look like your surroundings have this slightly milky white filter over them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when it was nighttime, <laughs> um, I could <laughs> not see a thing. I was like effectively blind in nighttime. And this, this place was like very nicely illuminated. I had no idea where the hell I was going. And um, obviously, that could have been very unsafe. At the same time, I decided to have a little bit of fun with it so if i heard someone walking near me and i needed to go somewhere i was like hello excuse me i can't see can you help me get somewhere and they were like uh y yeah sure and it led to some very fun interactions like i had this very like surprised orc lady who was just like you know minding her business like traveling along anvil in the middle of the night and just this very tiny naga being like hi excuse me can you help get somewhere <laughs> oh what what's funny like like oc the like, a lot of the orc players will say how much their vision is already impaired so that i think that is a case of pretty much the blind leading the blind <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's that's a great story and the imperial orc and the naga walked off and they were never <laughs> they they, they, walk, get back they walked into the woods. <laughs> they seen walked again. into Navarre and they were lost forever. <laughs> oh, she was really nice though. She took me. She took me to Yurza to one of the main tents, and I was like, "Oh, thank you so much. Do you want to drink something? Do you want to sing songs with us?" And she had lots of fun. Oh, that's amazing. It was very fun. <laughs> Next interaction I had with you in character was um, at E4, and it was after I'd been on a deadly night skirmish. And oh, <laughs> you looked, you, girl, you looked rough. That was rough. <laughs> rough. Oh, I was like, oh my god, what have they been up to? I got oh. exercised. <laughs> that was terrifying, and when we came through the gate. Um, I remember coming through and having, you know, all my own friends attack me because, yeah. you know, I was a bit cray cray. And then, and after that, it was then seeing you. Um, and I was like, you know, dying at that point. And it was just you being like, no, she is coming into the hospital. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I made friends with the right person here. 
I was seen so quickly. <laughs> yeah, so because, the, uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so the, the, the hospital part of the, that's, um, a, would you say that is a big part of your game now then? Do you, um, because I don't know anything about the hospital other than the view from on my back. So I, what, what can you tell us about the actual hospital itself? Because I don't know anything about it. <laughs> so actually, the interesting thing about the hospital is that it was not established by PD. It was established by players. Oh, wow. Okay. So the whole concept of the hospital was established by players. The tent is provided by the players. Um, yeah. And it, it's mainly player driven that the hospital is a thing in Anvil, which a lot of people don't realize or think about because they're just so used to seeing the hospital there. And it's like, yeah, like, they're just existing. They're just there to help with, like, battles and stuff. And when some people actually get to know that it's mainly, like, driven by players, it's a very surprising thing. And everyone is so dedicated in there. When I first started going to Empire, I was a Steiner physic. Mm-hmm. And I got into the healing game because of my the people that I was involved in. They were like, yeah, come to the hospital and let's go. And <laughs> the thing with the hospital, it's definitely a big family unit because they just saw my character just fresh into Anvil, eager to learn. And they were like, baby, come here. We'll teach you <laughs> right now. <laughs> So as the time has progressed, I decided to branch my game out in different ways. For example, I am the person who drives the economy of my spire, which is my which is the player group that I'm in. Mm-hmm. And I occasionally go to the hospital because I'm like, oh, I want to see if there's some interesting things. For example, the whole things with the exorcisms, if they need help. Because in a way, I still feel not obliged, but I still really like dropping by helping out and seeing the people that uplifted my game since I was a little bean, (laughs) you know? It's Uh, like, yeah, it's interesting that you, you saying that with you being so young at the time, because, um, again, being there in the hospital, I wasn't sure what I expected, but what I did not expect was an actual child to be sitting next to me, holding my hand and telling me that it's okay. Like, I remember exactly what she said. She was like, it's okay. We're going to start stitching now, but you can squeeze my hand as tight as you want. And I'm here for you. And she's like stroking my arm and holding my hand. I'm like, oh my gosh, these tears are for you. <laughs> so cute like I remember oh. I remember every time that I was in the hospital and I was with everyone you know and we're all just like you know laying on the benches just being like oh, let's see what's going on and then suddenly like little girls with like their little baskets would come and like we're sending sweets we're sending sweets someone like sweets and every you can bet every single visit like just minding their business and they're going like sweets <laughs> <laughs> And also, adorable children. Of course. Like, of course we're going to buy your sweets. That's right. (laughs) And especially, like, kids at Empire. I... So, so sweet. So, it's... All of my interactions with children at Empire have always been amazing. Especially with parents who are kind and responsible. Um, who really involve their kids into the fantasy aspect of it. Because yes. as a very highly lineage character, obviously any child's going to stare and going to be like, oh, you know, sometimes it can be a little bit scary or very fascinating. And so the best thing you can do is be with a very friendly disposition. And it's very, it gives a very fuzzy, warm feeling when the parent is like, oh, yeah, no, because you see, this person is another, so they have scales, and they have their fangs, and the kid is like, wow, I see, and they're just so curious, because they're so into it, and it's so wholesome, it's like, oh, my heart. Honestly, yeah, like, the, the kids at Empire, I, um, I, I work with kids, and I thought, I'm not going to want to have anything to do with the kids, okay, this is my holiday, I'm away from work, Oh no, instantly. That's it. Kids, they're, they're part of my game now. I absolutely love interacting with them. The, they're also some of the most knowledgeable players. Yeah. Like, <laughs> And the most bloodthirsty skirmishers. 
Oh yeah, they are. They're scary, <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> like you see them all lined up, like being led by whoever is in charge of the academy and such, like going off into a skirmish, and. Oh, they're just so deadly but so cute and when they come back they were like i remember one of them comes back from Rushka, and they were like yeah there were these big wolves and we kicked their butts and then we took people to the hospital and we healed them and i used my herbs and i'm like you you go little adventurer like <laughs> honestly you see them going through and it's like i almost feel bad for the barbarians are about to encounter oh, yeah <laughs> no idea they're so <laughs> intense i love it i'm like you are a model citizen of the empire <laughs> little little child <laughs> oh dear so yeah the the hospital itself so i didn't i obviously i had no idea that it was all player run that is like i just because it's such a big part and it's a part when people are talking i will Basically, it's what I use sometimes to sell people on coming into Empire when I've got friends that are like, oh, I'd maybe want to LARP, but I don't want to fight and do things. And I'm like, there's so many things you can do. And I always use the hospital as an example. You know, you can literally, you know, spend your day helping and, and healing people. So if the hospital is completely player run, is there any kind of in-character funding that goes on to make sure the hospital stocked up with the right herbs and healing medicines and things like that? Yes. So we have the hospital fund. Okay. Um, some people tend to come to donate their herbs and their money to the hospital, especially because there's a lot of people who have herb gardens and different herbs that they don't really need. And they're like, you know what? Let's just get them to the hospital. Let's get some throws to the hospital. It should be good. A lot of players who run it also use their own personal economy to keep the hospital up and running as well Mm -hmm. and there are some people who try to come over to sell herbs to the hospital as well and they do end up buying them too um it's a mix between donations players who run it and are involved with it basing their own personal economy on the hospital and people selling herbs to them and even though it's player run because obviously it's a pretty significant part of anvil as well um, we do sometimes get NPCs floating around, trying to be curious, and we also have refs nearby. For example, when you guys were getting cursed, we did have the refs nearby to make sure that everything was going accordingly. So yeah. while it is um, mean, mainly driven by the players, there is a level of acknowledgement by PD to make sure to also engage with it in a way that feels fulfilling and obviously that sticks within the rules if that makes sense yeah yeah no definitely um yeah I mean because I didn't actually even consider the fact that you could go and donate herbs to the hospital and I'm like literally sitting there thinking that the amount of times I've had herbs I'm like I don't know what to do with these I guess I'll sell them or I'll do this with them but after speaking to, because we had Enwed Kelly on from the Imperial Orcs, and she spoke to us about the sort of um, the healing side of things and the fact that, yeah, you end up using a lot of your your own valuable resources on what are essentially complete strangers. And then they're gone. And I was kind of thinking after that interaction, I thought, wow, I want to try and figure out a way of actually repaying the people who have actually helped and healed me. Um and have used their resources in that way but I didn't even consider you know just going and here have some of my herbs I hope you can help someone else (laughs) you should you should have given it to the hospital the best call Mm -hmm. um when you have especially for people who have who are like oh I have way too many herbs I don't do potions I don't do selling that much the best thing that you could do is either donate them to the hospital or try to pinpoint the because there's different player groups who do go to battle constantly yeah and sometimes in some of the nation meetings and stuff they will say like oh this and this people are going to go to battle or these and these people are responsible for the healing aspects of it and if you are not interested in getting them for money you can just as easily do that research into pinpointing the people within your nation that are keeping your allies and your fellow nation members alive in the battlefield and giving out your herbs to them if that is something that you want to do, for example. 
Yeah, no, exactly. That's, that's like a really good way of doing it, actually, because, yeah, there's a lot of us that do end up with herbs and we don't use them or we don't have any real use for them. Um, I think at one point I, well, both of um, both Godric and Arnell ended up just every time we got herbs, we just kept giving it to the same person who could make potions out of them because they're like, oh, you can make things. And um, that person was making, getting potions made and then giving those out to brand new players so that they had, you know, um, their 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 healing potions um, to go out into the battlefield with if they were new players. And I thought, oh, that's a really good tradition. I'll keep donating to that because um, then, then, yeah, it's really good for everybody to, especially those, like you said, that are going out into the actual battle as well. Um, but yeah, so the so obviously um, I know that you are you, you go to Empire and things like that. Do you do you do many player events or have you done many player events so far this year? So this year has been because my life has been a little bit busier. Mm-hmm. I haven't done as many. I've only done one which is Tale of Favors. Oh. Which is a Donish event um it, it's very really fun it's essentially it's organized by house matros mm-hmm. and it's in celebration of the birthday of the earl and they host a ball and the way that set player event is structured is that you socialized and then they give you like little dance cards so if you want to dance with people you can ask them and like write yes. down the person that you're going to dance with oh wow <laughs> so cool <laughs> And then what they do is that um, the dances are usually quite nice and simple. And what they do is they give you a little um, instruction on how to dance them. So group dances, it has happened that some people are like, oh, no, what are we doing? Uh, Going this or doing that or step this, step that. But eventually people get into the gist of it and everyone has a lot of fun with it. (laughs) Um, They also take a little bit of time before the actual event itself to also run through the dances out of character so in case people have a little bit of performance anxiety over them being like oh i'm not gonna do good i'm not doing do well then they can prepare like that so they have like a little dance instructor to make sure that that happens that sounds wonderful <laughs> nevertheless um <laughs> because i've been going to it for like two years now to that player event and even i mess up sometimes and it's all part of the fun because not everyone is a gifted dancer and it's just a matter of just being in that um in the whole thing of like interacting with everyone speaking with people you wouldn't usually speak to and what's the best way to break the ice and just dance with someone that you don't know <laughs> yeah i'd like to, i'd definitely like to go to a, a player event where there's some dancing going on i think i think there's there's already not enough dancing at anvil i mean there, there's a lot of places that do dancing at anvil but it's all right because we do, we do a lot of singing, a lot of storytelling, a lot of there's a lot of music, but there's there's not a lot of fighting. Uh, but I don't think there's enough dancing. We need to do some more dancing in the Glory Square, away, I think. Yeah, we should have a big like you know. I I feel like one of the evenings the Glory Square should just turn into a big ballroom style, and everybody comes and dances in the Glory Square. <laughs> it's just a matter of like organizing it, and sometimes it can be spontaneous. Like the one time i remember dancing in anvil Mm -hmm. which was super fun and it was just so whimsical it was after everyone had finally gone across the sentinel gate and it was one of the egregores from the marchers and i remember that she is i think she's a cambion who has like little white flowers on her horns Mm -hmm. and she has a like an accordion okay yeah oh yeah 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 yeah. Uh uh-huh and yeah. she was playing it and everyone was like mm-hmm. twirling and dancing and like hooking arms with each other and just like dancing around and being super joyful it was so fun like i got the chance to because also like it brings out so many things from different characters who is like oh if you have a cheerful character everyone is like yeah get it and meanwhile if you have a more serious character who joins in the dancing and the revelry everyone is like yeah get it <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing you just like that those sort of things it just brings out a completely different side to people's characters as well that like you said you wouldn't normally see that sort of you know stoic um you know serious character you know like decided to be like right that's it let's do this you know it's just it just it opens up that sort of interaction and this that Definitely. little bit of silliness <laughs> i think everyone should be a little bit silly just a little bit silly <laughs> 
I agree. <laughs> yeah, if you don't feel silly, you're not doing it right, I don't think, when it comes to <laughs> You're dressing up in the middle of a field, putting on makeup, putting on thousands of pounds of kit. Yeah. With a tent. <laughs> sleep deprived. Slightly hungover. Just be a little silly. Just have fun yeah. with it. Yeah. I'm I'm actually curious going back to the um going back to the to the hospital and the healing and things like that. So I'm I'm curious. So you're you you played your character for a while then, right? So how how much how much how many like uh skills and things like that can you take in like physic and things like that before you're like maxed out? Or do you just take physic? You just take physic. Yeah. Because to get to, to take physic, you need coercion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And once you take physic you can do like almost everything. Really? You can yeah. Like you can use herbs, you can use potions you can, you can do a lot of stuff being a physic, and obviously, if you're a curator and a physic, as soon as you, as soon as your hands are on that person, mm -hmm. the bleeding time stops. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 I didn't actually know that. I, I thought that it was still sort of like within there some some somehow. I didn't I didn't realize that it's the second you get to them, it's oh yeah yeah like stabilizes. <laughs> yeah, the second you get to them and they put their hands on you if it's a physic your type like, like your bleeding timing stops like everything just pauses and then it you only get healed and stable and stabilized properly when they start actually healing you right by, okay, uh, yeah. by a herbs or role play usually in the hospital in the hospital itself it's mainly role play yeah. Obviously, in the battlefield, it's where the mechanics of the herbs and the potions and the magic takes more place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will say that, especially role playing those injuries and everything in the hospital and taking that s small amount of time to really hash it out and not only have the doctor have fun actually operating with you, but you as the patient. The very brave or very screamy or very crying or very fearful patient and just like it's my time to shine. Yeah. Get that Oscar. I, I always feel bad about not uh talking about the hospital more and talking about the the healing game more because it's something that kind of like either just like slips my mind, but when people talk about all the different aspects of Empire and it's such a massive and obviously really important part and it's like you say there's an entire like players have literally just put a hospital there and they've gone right we're going to dedicate all of our role play time to being in the hospital because there's certain players that will just be in the hospital like the entire weekend right <laughs> yeah yeah because especially i did find that especially people who have non-com roles and such especially in the hospital it's people who um not a majority, but a lot of people that I know have mobility issues mm -hmm. or I know they're virgin and they like the familiarity of that game and the closeness of everyone and the comfort of the fact that they can stay around and put in a spot, comfortable, having a nice chat with people and still get role play. Yeah. I will say that while healing is cool, one of the most hard things to role play. I think is when someone is terminal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I remember one of the things that it's like, yes, yeah, okay, you're gonna be fine. Let me just double check. Let me just make sure everything is good. And you grab that, you grab that traumatic wound card, and you open it. And when you read it, and the first thing you see is it's too late. The patient is terminal. You're like, oh wait, oh, so. What? So hang on. That exists. Yeah, I didn't even know that was a thing. So like, so are the players like un unaware of that, or is that something they're given if they kind of um, know that they're they're gone? Um, it depends on the severity of the injury, because sometimes if your character is already injured mm -hmm. and you keep getting traumatic wound after traumatic wound, yeah. Sometimes if you sustain a certain amount of damage or are in a certain condition under a certain amount of time, then the refs might give you a terminal card Ooh. it's it's rough yeah. i remember when i think she i think she was a dornish she was a dornish noble 
yeah. although she was Danish. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I unfortunately didn't get acquainted with them as much afterwards because I was really, really busy and I feel really mm-hmm. bad about that because that could have been really, really cool roleplay. But I remember her coming through the Sentinel Gate, like she had her face obscured and she was like bleeding. And I was like, oh crap. Okay, I'm just gonna mm-hmm. take her. I'm like, hey, no, it's okay, you're fine. And I laid her down. And she had this prosthetic on her face that was essentially this big gash down her face. And yeah. she looked really bad. And I was like, okay, cool. This is going to be like a cool healing role play. I'm going to get like so many stuff done. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be fun. I get I inspect her and I'm like, it's going to be fine. It's going to be good. I get given the card. I open it. The lacerations and the internal bleeding are too much. This patient is unfortunately terminal. And I was like, and oh, then their dear. whole house came over to the hospital and saw her. And I had to be the one to tell them, we can ease her pain, but she's not getting better. Oh, that's deep roleplay. Right? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> she's not going to get better. Like, whatever attacked her, which apparently was a humongous bear, whatever attacked yeah. her, it did too much damage. <clears throat> you know, like heartbroken and they were like thank you so much we'll just take it from here and they just like picked her up like princess carried her back to dawn and i was like i need to go back to Yurizen, to the tea house sit down and have some hot chocolate <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah yeah what I, what I like about the well actually so the the traumatic wound cards i mean even though like we're, we're hearing like shock being like oh are there ones that say that you like the one that i had um at e4 that it, it kind of gave you an indication of when that it might be a problem because the, the card said you know you find it you you feel a, uh, a sharp pain i think mine said you feel a sharp pain in your left uh side under your arm yeah um after the you you find it after an hour you're going to find it difficult to breathe um, if you leave it like two hours, then you're going to collapse. So that that kind of gave me an indication as a player. It's just like, well, if I choose to leave it, I could be risking my yeah. character. Basically, yeah, yeah. So, um, and then I, funny enough, I what it was is that I had uh, one of my ribs had punctured my heart, <laughs> so yeah. or, or my lung. Sorry, your so, spleen. Spl- uh, spleen. That was it. Yeah. yeah. All, 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 the, all the organs. One of the organs it, it punctured. punctured. All of them. Yeah. Right, punctured, went We're not physics. <laughs> was, this, was this a fight against the Jotun, perhaps? No, it was. Uh, it was the the, the Druge. I, I flung myself into a Druge line uh, on my own. It was really funny. And I got ganged up. <laughs> I got, I got... It was. Oh, it was beautiful. It was like one of the Druge got me. And they got me and I was down and I was getting healed. And the the the, the my favorite line that I heard from the, the other people in Dawn was Godric did not take, you know, um take issue with this one Druge. He took issue with all of the Druge <laughs> when they knocked her down and he just ran in. I thought my line was coming with me. I thought everyone was joining me. <laughs> Probably not. Oh. You ran in. <laughs> oh, geez. As a physic. Please don't do that. <laughs> Die. <Yeah>. Die. <laughs> well, you know, I, I got I got surgery and I was saved, but the physic player came up and found me after the event out of character and said to me, Yeah, you were very close to dying, by the way. Like if you had left oh. that, like if you had left that like a, an hour or so, then you were probably gone. I was like, Terminal, yeah. yeah. Because here's the thing, like the pro tip is if you don't want to lose your character to an injury from a battle, as soon as you get that little slip. Of traumatic mm-hmm. wound no matter how small it is you go to the hospital or you go to a physic and you get that sorted yeah. because otherwise your character will your character will die because you're not allowed to look at anything else but front and back yeah only the physics are allowed to open that up yeah can, so, so can, can the physics do that because i just left it till because i was like god not going to deal with this until he like gets through so because the, the for those who don't know this the hospital is uh, is situated right by the Sentinel Gate, yeah. and the hospital people are very efficient with like because obviously for oh, yeah. out of character, out of character health and safety issue because there's loads of people coming from the gate and everyone's just like oh, oh, oh. and there's lots of ruckus. Uh, the hospital people will be like, 
if you're not injured, keep moving. Please. If you are, <laughs> come come to us because it can get gummed up in there. Uh, so yeah, I just it can I just be quite dangerous. Yeah, that's right. So so I just I just waited. Can you get those traumatic wound cards like sorted on the battlefield? No. No, I, I think you have to pretty much wait until you get to the hospital, you have, right? You have yeah. to wait until you get to the hospital, yeah, yeah, because you have to, you have to have that time of role play to solve that, to solve the actual wound because it is a traumatic wound. Yeah. Mm. They're not going to be able to sort it out because, as far as I'm aware, there's no potions that sort traumatic wounds. There's no herbs that sort traumatic wounds. There's no magic that sorts traumatic wounds. As far as I'm aware, I could be wrong. I think I think there's a potion. I think. Cool. How expensive it is, though. It's. I think it's a very expensive potion. I could be wrong on that. Yeah, because I like, I think cause I thought it was surgery. I thought surgery was like the only option if that happened. Because, yeah, I got um when I had a traumatic wound, it happened in dawn, and I got mm. surgery. I think right there at dawn. Honestly, at E4, we had, um, there was a lance um, with us in Dawn and they were just filled with them um, with healers and that's what their their focus was. And it got to a point where the, the Druge line were just meters away from our healers because we couldn't go any further back with them. And that's when we're like, well, we're going to have to push the Druge away from the healers at this point. And they were just healing everyone as fast as they possibly could. So it was like, you couldn't do like a big ritual or something. I don't, I don't think. Not no, easily. It's <laughs> not, it's it's like, um, unless people, and there's really, really pushing them back, which is already really tricky to do, depending on which units you have on battlefield. It's... It's not possible because then the thing no. when you get a traumatic wound as well, it's not only like, oh yeah, you you do you do whatever, you use whatever herb and that's it. Like you have in you know, extent you should role play out what you're doing. For example, um I hit like obviously fantasy brain surgery <laughs> where <laughs> because when you are doing a fight Against Jotun, and you will get a lot of blunt force trauma wounds. And someone got that to the head. I, I don't know how. But they were like, they have like little things, they have like little bits of bone stuck in the brain. Mm. Oh, gosh, and okay. If you don't get them out, and if you don't get them out and stuff, like the brain will hemorrhage and then they'll die. So you have to like role play that. Or if you have like a puncture thing, then you have to like take out the bone and like. You know, like suture up the thing during the blood or a blood clot because they got hit so hard and you use the leeches. I've seen people being very creative with their um, role play yeah. when it comes to <laughs> surgery and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And um, like, yeah, like the, I, I love the sort of role play with the surgery. Um, I was fighting in a tourney in the Glory Square in Dawn, as you do. And the we've got a little like Glory Annex set up now, which is a little like extension to it. And they decided to set up a triage area there. They put a little beds out, everything else. And it, it was great because, you know, we we all got hurt. And I got my first ever traumatic wound. And I was like, oh, you know, I've got a bit of a pain. I'm sure it's nothing. And then the um the the physical they, they, they opened it up and went, okay no we're gonna have to get you now straight over there and we did lots of role play and we, we had a little chat first about some of the consent because they then got a load of water and like covered me in it and everything and they were like padding it down and stuff and doing and we had like it was really cool because one of the kids saw me go down and this kid, um, honestly I love them to bits and they saw me go down and they went and got me a cup of water they ran up to me at the bed. They gave me the cup of water and they went, who got you down? Pointing them out to me. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. I just said this child assassin. Terrifying. <laughs> I'm like, it's okay. It's a tourney. We're fine. <laughs> they are terrifying. It's like, oh. Yeah, that's the one thing with It's the... just always the kids. They're so chaotic. <laughs> yeah. That's the one thing with the, when we have uh, the tournaments in the Glory School, when they do get quite big. And when the refs are present, then yeah, you are at risk of getting traumatic wounds if refs are present because oh, yeah. they're not always present when you're like fighting in Anvil. Um, but yeah, if they are present, that's very it's a, 
<laughs> so it's I'm, usually prearranged. <laughs> yeah, so we, we we stopped recording for a little bit there, but I've looked up. Uh, I've, I've tried to look up things that would stop traumatic wounds. I can't find the only thing because the the wiki is so very easy to navigate. Um, I can't find any potions or anything that heals it. Uh, we've got some armor, so enduring bre the enduring bless breastplate, bless plate? the enduring breastplate, uh, words Ollie, uh, means that you can just ignore the effects of a traumatic wound until the battle is over or until your fight is over. So I think that there's things that stop it. Uh, but that doesn't mean... Yeah. No. Yeah. You can ignore the effects. Yeah. Which yeah. means if you have a, if 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 your arm is like bent in like five different places, yeah, you don't feel that arm being bent in five different places, but the arm is still bent in five different places, and you need to sort that out. I'm pretty sure as well in the in the rules of um, so hero points, I think because you can use a hero point to ignore any role play effect. Uh, so you can do this. I think you can do the same with. A hero point so you could you could be like oh i'm just going to use it like if you, it says oh yeah you know you feel like your arm is 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 in is in terrible pain you know you could just be like i'm just gonna spend a hero point to ignore that i guess uh but I it can't... is a double-edged sword yeah yeah so I can't... yeah so still nothing actually yeah because you still need to yeah oh, no no you could go for it because as well it's a double-edged sword because when you have rituals or armor or herbs that make you ignore these conditions to your character some people role play it in a way that to their character that they're not aware of the real damage that they have sustained mm -hmm. and that is where the highest risk of characters dying by traumatic wounds begins because some people are really deep into the role play and they're like you know if it's a, if 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 this herb says that i can ignore the pain then my character is not going to realize that mm -hmm. like they are bleeding internally. Yeah. And that's where the danger comes in. Because obviously if you have something that allows you to ignore this effect, that means that you're that it, you're just not aware that you're slowly dying. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when a lot of death occur as well. <laughs> but they are fun though, like <laughs> the traumatic moods <laughs> also. Also, they're, they're almost like a little bit of a um that they because they're like a bit of a merit badge because the 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 refs it's not it's not a random process for so if people don't know how the traumatic wounds are handed out the refs so they have to be given by a ref and they're given to a player and it's usually because yeah. you have done some sort of amazing role play to deserve one basically so if you've done like something some really stupid it's something stupid <laughs> no if you heroically <laughs> heroically charged into the enemy line you know very bravely and by yourself you got yeah got your ass <laughs> handed to you then you will probably receive one but it is it's cool because you get singled out being like yep there you go <laughs> you're in trouble <laughs> like, but it's cool because you're just like for oh. me it was just like running away from the heralds and he's like here you go broken nose and i'm like <laughs> thanks <laughs> 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 that, that is one thing that I want to add to my kit. I keep actually forgetting. I need to make a, maybe make a note of it here because I keep meaning to add some like um, fake blood and things like that and some kind of injuries, bandages and things like that to my kit to take out because there's been a lot of times like when I got that traumatic wound and there's been a few times like my ear prosthetic has been a bit kind of like out of shape and I'm just like, or it's been like knocked off and I'm like, ah, I don't, I can't put it back on, but I don't want to make it look like I've lost the top of my ear. So I would, it would be cool if I had just had some blood just to put on it, just so it looks like I've just got an injury there, you know, until I can get the prosthetic back on. Um, yeah, that's, 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 some, that's something that I want to add for next time. I keep forgetting. It's a good thing because like uh, one of the big issues that the hospital has as well is that people use, the physics use their bandages. Mm -hmm. Not many people give them back. Nope. And... Yeah. <laughs> And so it is a bit of a struggle because then you have to, because people don't bring them back and you have to just keep buying more and more and more bandages. Yeah. So, and also some people might not want blood on their kit. Yeah. Which is fair enough. And honestly, if you end up bringing your own, 
as long as they don't encumber you in battle, if you want to bring in your own things, like your own bandages, and you can just like whisper real quick to your physic, like, hey, is it okay if you could do this? Or is it okay if you could secure that? They will be incredibly happy to help. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I've, I've, lo I've lost a physics bandage before <laughs> because they've like bandaged me up. And then I'm like, oh, I'll make yeah. sure I return that. But then by the time I got back from the battlefield, because they, they, they patched me up on the battlefield, they're like, oh, I'm just going to... That was the orc physic that, yeah. that like tied my <laughs> uh, kneecap back onto my leg. And she was like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to I'm just gonna t t tie this and you'll be good. And then by the, by the time the battle was over, because that was a long battle, uh, mm. <laughs> yeah, the bandage was just gone. <laughs> it wasn't there Terrible. Anymore. Terrible. Bad. So I'll have to find that physic again. I kind of want to um like get because I've got like a lot of bandages in the house. I kind of want to get them and blood stain them and re-roll them up so that they're in my pocket now, just so that I can be like, I have a blood stained bandage. Can you wrap it on me? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and that's a hundred percent fine, honestly, because I feel like in a way it saves the physics from potentially losing more bandages and also gives the dramatic impression of like, oh my god, you have blood on you, but not like blood on your actual beautiful pretty expensive kit because, yeah. Oh. yeah plus we're Danish. we don't really we, we kind of like to keep clean <laughs> yeah and it's, it's also it's also good to to kind of signal to people as well that you've been treated because so like I, i've when i had surgery done on me with the spleen i kind of i, I didn't I, I could have done with some like bandaging or something because obviously then i was like role playing out that i was still sore from it but then people kept asking, have you seen a physic? Have you seen a physic? Have you seen a physic? Because they were worried they were going to die. They all thought something. you were terminal. Because <laughs> like, we, oh. we want that to dawn. And I had my arm around him and he's doing that. And but I didn't, I didn't understand. I didn't fully understand what terminal meant because people were like looking over and they were like, is he? And I was like, and they're like nodding <laughs> back. Like, yeah, he had surgery. <laughs> I did not realize what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least terminal will be relieved. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now you know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, speaking of that, actually, uh, oh. I feel like Urizen and uh, Dawn now have a very strong bond because uh, a, a bond sealed with Dornish blood. <laughs> because I know you say you don't usually get into politics, Noah, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I think I think um, yeah, there, there seems to be a lot of uh, love between. Uh, a lot of love being thrown our way from Urizen after E4, you know, because it was quite a, <laughs> it was quite a bloody one for us. Oh, like before I joined Urizen, oh, I remember, and everyone was so, like broken hearted about it. It was a bad battle. Information got misconstrued, mm -hmm. and more than half of the Urizen player base died. Like characters that had been established. Yeah. Since E one E one year one. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Dead. Yeah. In one fell swoop. I remember everyone was so bummed out, and especially when doing the remembrance, um, gatherings and celebrations and such. Mm -hmm. In your reason, I could really feel people still being like, "Oh God, virtuous damn it!" Like so many people died. I was like. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's rough, buddy. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Actually, do do you have um, what kind of what kind of festivals and things are there in have? Because like we like we have like our flower festival and uh, a lot of other nations. Uh, like we also they... have a flower fe you festival. You do, <laughs> Robin. You know this. How uh, I've heard about this. <laughs> <laughs> so, Robin, what do you know about this? Because of I can see whether I have to correct you or not. <laughs> you probably will, because I don't know <laughs> anything about it other than an Uruz any person saying to me, well, we have our flower codes as well. And I was like, oh, you have flower codes. And I was told that there are flower codes and there is um, different meanings behind the flowers and that they um, have a deeper understanding to them when it comes to like, because obviously in Dawn, we have our flower codes that are related to each of our houses and we give them accordingly. Um, and I was speaking to people in Uruz and they were like, oh yeah, no, we have our flower codes as well, but they are a little bit different from yours. And we therefore really appreciate the gifts of flowers. And I was like, oh, that's all I know. That's everything I know. <laughs> so because in Uruz the flower codes are actually virtue based. So for example, 
if I were to give to you a red flower, red means, I think it means, no, it, mean, it didn't mean pride, it meant ambition. Okay. I think it meant, I think it meant ambition. And different flowers come with different meanings. But to add to that complication as well, because the same as Danish Flower Festival is complicated, Eurasian and Flower Festival can also be complicated as well. You have to look at the relationship you have with that person to tell whether if it's a compliment or an insult. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For example, Leo has a father figure in his life who's named Dr. Tiberius. And he gifted him a pink flower, which pink is for pride. Okay. And looking at the relationship, it, it was very endearing because it's like, oh, he's saying that he's proud of him <laughs> by gifting him that pink flower. That's so sweet. Um. Meanwhile, if you want to be super shady and you really, really don't like that other person and you think they are a bastard, and that they're unvirtuous you will give them a bouquet of every single flower color representing each virtue which means <laughs> it's the biggest insult of them all because it means <laughs> really is that you are an unvirtuous person and you should look for every single virtue in your life because you are unvirtuous i know how god you could respond to Meanwhile, that he'd you be really, like really I'm... really really <laughs> I would be like, I'm the most virtuous person they ever. Me. They gifted me the way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But meanwhile, if if you give that to some, if you give that whole bouquet to someone that you really, really, really adore, it's a very significant gift mm -hmm. because you are either saying that they are the embodiment of all virtues, a very virtuous person, or that. They are the world to you. Yeah. And they embody every single virtue to you because they they are your way. They are your one true thing. <laughs> and I know that we also have the ribbons, um, which is up for certain interpretations. Mm -hmm. I haven't delved into the ribbons system a little bit too much because to mm -hmm. me it felt a little bit complicated and convoluted um, but um, some of the ribbons can um, have either very mean messages like watch your back themed oh, yeah <laughs> nice or or, <laughs> or some other ribbons that depending on their combination can be oh I have a very deep platonic love to you or you know let's just wink wink nudge nudge <laughs> you know what I'm saying uh, I want to see that red on a <laughs> Wink, quick, nudge, nudge. <laughs> it depends on the color combinations and who you're giving it to. And then um, some viewers any would be like, oh, that's so sweet of you. And others will be like, they will, like, some of them will go insane trying to figure out what did you mean? It will be rude to ask, but what did you mean? You confuse me. <laughs> <laughs> and it ensues the hilarity and the awkwardness because, as you know, here is any poise, arate, very keeping up appearances, very keeping it together, and they can't show their confusion because they're they're confused. Scandalous. Yes. So <laughs> there has there has been a couple of instances in these past like flower festivals where you just see the zero zeni just holding a bouquet or a small like couple of flowers with the ribbons, just staring at them like what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> when 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 is the flower festival in Urizen then? Same as yours. Ah, so uh E2. Yep. Oh well that's that's a good oh, we're gonna have some drives fun. even more confused. <laughs> yes, it's been happening for years and every single time it happens, it's like, oh you are any else it's like a t -t 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 insert Donish person here, like, oh it's so fun. You are any have your little flowers as well, like us, and it's like yeah, because we also have a flower festival. What do you think it's for? <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, that's yeah. Well, it's a good excuse to come over to to Urizen. That's I mean, I've I've not I've again I've ne- I've never actually been over to the camp at all. Like I said, and I think I think there was a few as any that kind of uh, came to pay their condolences um after the yeah after all the zenith stuff i don't i'm not i'm, I'm interested to know i'm <laughs> so what's so what's happening currently in the campaign is that uh yeah we're obviously like zenith we've got zenith back um and it looks like i don't know if you've read it what a cost <laughs> yeah what what did it cost <laughs> uh well i don't know if you've like been keeping up with the like the winds noah but like it's it sounds very much like pd want to kind of keep us doing stuff in Zenith because like yeah well we, 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 we've got it back but it's still there's still a lot to do and the Dornish are just like no off to the Barons <laughs> we've done our bit for Zenith <laughs> goodbye <laughs> Barons now please because like unfortunately when it comes to Eurozen because certain territories have been under barbarian control for mm-hmm. such a long time yeah. especially the Druze Oh, the Druze. Yeah, can we just kill the Druze already? <laughs> no, but something, something hate cultists. How dare you want to kill barbarians that poison the land, poison your family, poison and murder everyone? Yeah. People will call you a hate cultist if you say that. No, nah, no. Nah, I think we, we made it like a national oath to just eradicate them. <laughs> so... Uh, they might yeah. need to. They might need to inquisit the entirety of Dawn, but I'm pretty sure it would be a slap in the face after what we did to get him, <laughs> to get him back. Let's I just mean, let's just assassinate a lot of them. I mean, if we get enough of us, enough sneaky people, we're just going to go in and want to assassinate a lot of them. Done. <laughs> because I remember with the impact that Drusha Dawn, that there was this very um very unfortunate series of events, especially involving the hospital, about the Drush poisons. And they were poisons that they didn't know the antidotes to. They didn't know exactly what they did. What? And it was a lot, a lot of trial and failing and a lot of research, many NPCs and stuff dying because of set poisons. And oh, it was very intense. Like, I do personally think that the Druze are definitely a force to be reckoned with, especially because in Eurozone, the land is already so damaged mm-hmm. because we got s- <laughs> we got spiral back but we don't have spiral back but we got spiral back we don't have spiral back but we quite not have spiral but we quite have spiral so how many territories and... do you actually have currently like to if you like to create nor is any character and you choose a territory what have you got as your options if i remember well because don't quote me on this you can have a character in Morrow, mm-hmm. um, Redoubt, and that's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I know you were losing ground a lot. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. because we lost Zenith to the Druze, we lost Spiral to the Grendel several times, and. The whole thing with the Black Plateau happened. Oh, Black Plateau. It's still a big mystery and I find it so interesting. What, what's... Black... Well, what what is what is um what is that? <laughs> oh there's a very <laughs> catchy song. Wait, wait, what, what what is it? <laughs> there's a very catchy song about the Black Plateau as well. Oh. So Spiral is essentially so the reason lived in Spiral long before there was an empire, essentially. Yeah. And even then, it was really isolated. Um, what happens in Spiral is that very, very powerful magic was at work in there. And it caused trouble for a lot of Eurozeni that had settled in there. And at the heart of the territory is the Black Plateau. Mm-hmm. And it's essentially a, it's a great lake. Pla- it's a big plateau made out of volcanic glass. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, it has a lot of malignant energy. Any, you know, artifacts from the Black Plateau, like, um, like Black Plateau, like glass daggers and the such, are considered haunted and cursed, and that's why they're usually destroyed when they're when they're found. 
Um, usually when players get their hands on them, it's a very tricky situation because the weapons themselves make an effect on your character's psyche. And the majority of the people who handle these weapons and of barbarians who are around there, they are insane, essentially. Oh, what you see? Um, they've been driven mad because the Black Plateau, it's something. It's alive. What we know for now is the Black Plateau is alive. Okay. <laughs> and what <laughs> happened is that what happened is that um, if I remember well, there was a very big there was a very big fight in that area. Uh, as a way to like condense it a little bit. There was a lot of fighting, there was a lot of like very heavy war crimes happening in there as well. And because the Black Plateau feeds off of the negativity and the hatred. Ah, uh, right, okay, yeah. Then all of the hatred that was caused by that fighting had the Black Plateau explode in magic in a way that was felt over the entirety of the territory we were in, and it left people feeling instinctively scared and paranoid. And the people who were fighting near the Black Plateau essentially just, even if they were allies, they essentially like slain each other, oh if I remember well. What? <laughs> it was a big like area okay. of effect. And ever since then, the Black Plateau has been awake and oozing energy. Uh, it's very uh, interesting. We still, as far as I'm aware, and as far as the things that I know, we still aren't quite sure what it exactly is. It's just living. Yeah. Let's go there. Yeah, well, you guys have fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to the Barons. No, Do you want to call us the Barons? Come on. <laughs> There's enough room in the Barons for all of us. Let's go to deal with them. I think if I remember well, I could be wrong, but if I remember well, there were some like glass daggers from the Black Plateau and Barons that were found. Ooh. Yep. In that case, yeah, if you guys want to come. Yeah, that's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it just it just made me laugh like just 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 reading the, the the winds and being like it just it's like oh yeah you know in zenith there's still a load of pillars and there's still some druge left i'm just like yeah all right okay it's, that sounds very much like they're going to be like oh yeah this skirmish is in zenith and there's there's going to be battle opportunities in zenith and uh the all dawn wants to do is be like right we sorted this out let's uh head off to the barons <laughs> let's do you, you you deal with zenith. yeah <laughs> Because what happens as well is, oh, sorry, Robin. Go no, ahead. no, go for it. No, you're fine. Essentially, one of I remember one of the skirmishes more or less. Oh, one of the egregores went with the skirmish um, team as well, and everyone in Eurizen was so net and so worried. And what happened is they came back and they were like coughing and wheezing and everything because apparently the druids had made rituals that essentially made the earth, the air, the water, the greenery poison. Everything was poison. Yeah, sounds like them. Yeah. <laughs> because, it, like, in character, I love fighting the Druze. Out of character, they are cut. They're pretty terrifying to fight against because it's just like I'd prefer like <laughs> it's easier fighting the Jotun because it's just like it's a it's a full on you know one on one that's just that's just fight. Whereas the the Druze, it's just like. I know in character, I'm like, yeah, I just want to kill them all. Yeah, I'd, I'd take any opportunity to kill a druge, yeah. but out of character, I'm like, oh, I don't want to fight, go on a skirmish with a well, That's druge. the thing. Like, there's there's a little bit with the ocean, there's a little bit of honor there, I kind of feel like. There's that bit of, you know, there's, you know, they, they, they will have a fair fight, whereas the druge, they'll they'll poison us, they'll take prisoners, yeah. they'll execute people, they, you no, know. They, no, they don't execute people. They 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 just they just they just they just uh, wick you fall to the ground and venom you. <laughs> That's like... the same thing, okay? It's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, because when you get poisoned, you have less time to be alive. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> We're I'm... not executing, honestly. We're just going to um. Venom this person for a long time. <laughs> just gonna fill a little bit of poison in there. There you go. Just... Not executing. <laughs> well, let's um... just hope you research that poison. Yeah, we'll, oh. we'll, leave, we'll we'll leave that to the to the physics and the Rosani maybe. 
Yeah, um, they've got it. They've yeah, got us. Yeah, got <laughs> <laughs> Come crawling through the gate. <laughs> Leo, I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> Help me. That was the that was the cool thing about your to so you, you two that interaction you had. That was a cool thing because it like you first met at like E three, and then th- that uh, skirm that night skirm was just like right at the start of E four, and that's what makes it like a cool like this is one of the best parts about playing the empire game it's probably the same in other laps as well but like yeah. making those connections and then they like yeah. come forward at a different time you just like you go and speak to someone you have a, a cup of tea with someone and then an event later they're like there in, in another circumstance you're like i know that person and then your yeah. games just like cross over again and it's so cool yeah. it's i mean so like cool. out of character um <clears throat> sorry out of character i was genuinely a bit frightened at that point it was very late at night it was pitch black i had just like you know gone on the scariest skirmish i could imagine and i came back i was fighting and i was so confused people were telling me what was happening and i'd just been exercised i didn't know what that meant and then it was that way of just like i'd seen i saw you and i was like I recognize you. I know you. I'm safe. Yeah. <laughs> We're all good. I think especially the way that you have relationships with people is definitely when you you have to have a very distinct way of how you want to come across and how you interact with others. I think it's very, very important because that's going to mark not only the dynamic that you have with them in character, but also out of character. I do recall that moment because everyone, oh God, I got hit on the face with swords several times and I was like, oh, it hurts. You're like, well, that's no why cop. they took my weapons. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a moment where People had a, they were being, they were cursed essentially. And the curse was that they were losing the sight of colors. Everything was going black and white and they were seeing spirits and they were feeling weary and paranoia and such. So the way that you also direct yourself as the receiving end of that helps that interaction blossom as well because if you have a character who is in distress and who is confused then the best thing you can do is not be like oh calm down no it's like you bounce back right you have to like give and take yeah so instead of being like oh calm down no it's no big deal you just be like it's okay let's see can you see color no i know that you're hearing the voices and you're seeing the spirits but just listen to my boys ground yourself you will be like have that grandeur of lifting each other up and is makes for very cool moments and people should be less shy about doing that because it's not only gonna make the other person's role play better you're gonna feel like such a badass after as well you know oh yeah definitely yeah <laughs> yeah the person doing my um my exorcism was very much like that as well it was just like you know, okay, look, you know, the, I had the big sunburst on my chest, and they're like, fo- just focus on, focus on, focus on the side. It was just like, they just, they just like lift, they, they, they got to know my character in a short amount of time, and they just like uplifted the character, uplifted the character, you know, and it was just, it was, it was incredible. It was like incredible, um, it was an incredible bit of role play that you just don't expect. That, that night skirmish was both terrible and amazing. That's, it was it was so bad, <laughs> but it was so good. Oh, <laughs> that's the way that scared school. Yeah, oh. yeah. It, it's the way that you're just like, that was awesome from like, a, in a retrospect, you're just like, that was awesome. And the stories we have from it is amazing. I am not doing a night skirmish again. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm glad we did oh. it, but that's it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think some of the crazy things that i had to heal as well where i was like why are you doing this to yourself <laughs> apparently they were doing some trials for some journal summer trials as well some big okay. guys from the brass coast big boisterous gravitas presence and everything yeah, and they came back yep and they came back to the hospital and they were like oh it's so good to see your beautiful face leo my guts are open and i'm like okay just sit down <laughs> 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 you sit down and i just start to like 
stuff stuff his guts right back in and him being like oh you so you look so amazing healing me like we're doing this and this and that and i'm like uh-huh uh-huh you just keep talking i'm just gonna keep healing you and once i heal them i was like okay now take a lot of rest and okay we're gonna go to the next trial see you later and i was like no and they just kept coming back and forth back and forth back and forth <laughs> They were getting their asses kicked and then patched up and then their asses kicked again. It was a, it was I mean, like, I, that's just like so like brass like, coast oh. been like, hello, you're beautiful. By the way, my guts are out. <laughs> 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 Can you do something about this? <laughs> anyway, I'll see, you in, I'll see you in a bit when I'm, when I'm back. <laughs> oh, interview like that. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll hope, hopefully we'll, we, I d- we definitely need to get over and get some game in the, well, I do anyway, get some game with them. Um, Oh, I'm heading back at E1. I, yeah, I, I, I need to head back. I, I, I both like, well, I, I, def- I would definitely uh, hopefully get some interactions with you uh, yeah. as a physic in the hospital as well. Sort of like, obviously in character, probably not the best thing to be happening, but out of character, it would be, it'd be cool to, to be in there. But we are, yeah, we are, we are, um, yeah, we're well over time today. Yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah <laughs> like, well, I wanted to make sure we, we, had, we, had, we, had, we had a little bit of recording issue, so I wanted to make sure we get, we've got plenty of, um, plenty of content there um thank you very much for coming on noah uh i'm super super stoked so it's getting very close to e1 now it's getting very close to e1. yes oh, thank you so so much for having me it was delightful to speak to you guys it's an absolute pleasure and hopefully you'll come back on again uh one day right shall we say goodbye to the podcast everyone yeah sure bye podcast bye bye Bye-bye. Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure that you give us a thumbs up. Leave us a comment down below. Ring that bell so you know when a new episode is posted. If you want to support us or you want to get in touch with us, all the information will be in the episode description. You can go and check out some of these other episodes that we have done. But until next time, we love you and stay safe.